Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The Lord of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back, get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave his order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They're lazy. That is why they're crying out, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the word work harder for the people, so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, Why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, Make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, Lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required for you e of you each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you, for you have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials, and have put a sword to their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on you, this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see that I will do to Pharaoh. You will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, where they, decided as for, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go, tell Pharaoh of Egypt, 
and let the Israelites to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? I'm an old man now as I continue telling you our story. The story of how God, our God, created the heavens and the earth, created the billions of stars, created the planets including our earth, the God of our father Abraham, God who called out Abraham and said that he was going to bless Abraham. Bless Abraham and made promises to him, with him and for him. Little old Abraham of the Chaldees. Our father Abraham, the God who told Abraham specifically and with authority that Abraham would be the father of a great nation. Abraham would receive personal blessing. Abraham would receive personal honour and a grand status and Abraham would be a, a source of blessing to others to come. Father Abraham has been called personally and explicitly to follow God and allow God to be his God. And God is continuing to raise that family, to raise that nation unto himself. Centuries later, I, Moses, have also been called by God, personally and explicitly. I've related that to you earlier in this book of Exodus. I'm of that family which God is raising up, the nation of Israel. His holy nation the great God of Abraham and also of such amazing people, wonderful servants of God, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. I'm of that family. As a child on the threat of national male infanticide, I was placed by my parents into a basket. Do you remember I tell you that? They proceeded to put it into the reeds on the bank of the River Nile. There I was found by the Pharaoh's daughter who took me back to the palace and gave me the name Moses. And when they decided I needed a nursemaid, they went out to find me one. And do you know who the Egyptian princess unknowingly got to be my nursemaid? My mum! Wow! God was taking care of me even at that tender age. Isn't our God amazing and almighty. I've had many scraps and scrapes, as you know, from the beginning of this book. Yet God has honoured me and called me. He spoke to me from a burning bush. Me, Moses. There are more adventures to come through which you will hear about my life of following God and being a disciple of God. But for now, let me continue with our story in this book of Exodus, this amazing God, and tell you what happened when Aaron, my brother, and I went to Pharaoh in obedience to a command from the Lord our God. We were commanded by God to go tell the Egyptian king, the Pharaoh, to let go all the captive people of Israel. Well, we were to go, and why? We were to go on a three-day journey in order to host a festival in the wilderness where the Lord our God would be worshipped with sacrifice. And we're not even to that great book of Leviticus yet. An almighty God being worshipped by his peculiar people, his special nation, where God would be honoured, glorified and lifted up by his people in sacrificial worship. As commanded by our God, we went to Pharaoh and made the request, just as our God had said to do. How do you think Pharaoh reacted? I was used to the royal courts, but I was still not a very good speaker, so I took my brother Aaron with me. We were courteous to Pharaoh and obedient to royal protocol, as we should have been. And yet Pharaoh turned down our request. He claimed not to know who the Lord was the God of Israel. Therefore he turned down our request. He, of course, thought that he was a God himself, 
just as the Egyptian people thought that of him. And having turned down our request, he turned the screw upon us and increased the work and labour demands upon us. We were now to fetch our own straw for making their bricks, all the while making the same number of bricks, and he labelled us as indolent and lazy miscreants, liars. No doubt the bricks would have been used to make his tomb, the pyramid devoted to him. Oh, that Pharaoh was harsh and calculating. Therefore we left his presence for now. We'd been obedient to God as part of my discipleship and following of God. I was obedient and done as requested, commanded to do so by the Lord my God. In the coming days when as a nation we didn't achieve our required daily quota, our overseers were beaten with whips and flagellated by their Egyptian masters. So now our own overseers came to us, Aaron and myself, full of discontent and grumbling. Instead of humbling themselves, they flew off the handle in our faces. Not only did Pharaoh grumble and try us, so now also were those who were supposed to be our friends and our family. How unkind and unjust we can be towards each other. I, Moses, went back to the Lord, my God, to pray and converse with him. I know he has called me, I know he has commissioned me, but why is God bringing this trouble onto me, onto his people, his nation of Israel? O oh Lord, I cried, I've been obedient to you, yet all I'm getting is grief. All I'm getting is trouble, accusations and ill treatment. Pharaoh denies your existence, has done great evil towards your people, and yet you haven't done a single thing to help us out. You haven't rescued us as you promised, have you? Where is your mighty arm, O oh God? We haven't even seen you lift a finger to help let alone a whole hand or indeed an arm. O oh God, help and deliver me and your people from the brutality and bondage of Egypt. Then the Lord my God replied to me, O oh Moses, my child, you will indeed see how I rescue you and the nation of Israel from the despotic clutches of Egypt. Pharaoh will let you go because of my mighty hand. Trust me. I am God Almighty, as you well know. You know me. I am Jehovah, and I am is my name. Abraham didn't know my name, but you do. I will act on my promise and perform. This you will see and experience, my servant Moses. I am your God, and I will perfect what I have started. Have I not started? Indeed I have, as you well know when I called you, didn't I? I have the power to anoint lands and leaders. I, the Lord your God, also had the power to dismiss lands and leaders. I am the Lord your God, Moses, my friend. I will make this nation of Israel for me alone, a nation which shines as a light to the world of my glory, majesty, honour, goodness and greatness. I, the Lord your God, will bring my people, my nation, out of Egypt. I will rid my people, my nation, from bondage and slavery to Egypt. I will redeem you and give you a land which will be yours, for I am the Lord your God, Moses. Go and tell your people, my people, again of my promises. Remind them that I am their redeemer from bondage and slavery. Take heart, my dear Moses, and be uplifted. I am the Lord your God. Go. Feeling strengthened and encouraged by the Lord, I went back to the people of Israel and explained all that the Lord our God had told me. Yet, because of their troubles and being so taken up with those troubles and trials, they didn't listen, did they? Indeed, being stiff-necked, they refused to listen. As for me, Moses, I was to be obedient to God's request and go again to Pharaoh. 
We were to once more plead and implore for him to, to release us from slavery and bondage. And yet despite assurances from the Lord my God, I was still troubled and particularly because I was not eloquent of speech. Oh, the Lord is my God, my helper in times of trouble, and though I am weak in speech, I will go once again to Pharaoh. God will help me just as he has promised me. So let's take just a very few moments of silence to individually think about this passage. What has the Lord spoken to you about from this particular passage? Then after those few moments, I will continue. Thanks. Ah, Moses, our friend, the man who is later described as a friend of God. Moses, the man who was chosen by God, called by God, and a man who speaks with God face to face. And by face to face, we mean that their relationship and communication was very much like two people who spoke to one another as close friends do. Moses, a man whose discipleship of God, of lifelong following of God, involved intimacy, companionship and reciprocal relationship. And if you're a Christian here tonight, does that define your relationship with the God you claim to worship and follow? Moses, as we see here, had a prayer life which involves speaking to God in conversation and straight talking. No riddles or enigma. Straight, plain talking. You would think he was Australian. Again, does that define your prayer life as a Christian? Or is the conversation that you have with God one-sided where we just rattle off a whole list of wants and needs and don't give any time for God to answer? Or perhaps it's just me that often does that, is it? Because I know that I do. But from this passage as I read, reread, and thought about what to say tonight, I came up with at least a dozen things. So we're going to go through it. No, we're not. But fear not, I will boil it all down to just one word to look at tonight. And that word is obedience. There's a second word to come later, which is born from this word, which we will look at later. So our word tonight, obedience. And by obedience, I don't mean the fickle obedience of the overseers of Israel. Oh, they started out being obedient, but they soon got fed up when the going got too tough, didn't they? But we can't be too hard on them, because we probably would have done as well, wouldn't we? Some of us can't even mow the lawn without grumbling, let alone going out to get straw for bricks. And juxtaposed against their fickle obedience is the elegant and steadfast obedience of Moses. However, before we continue to look at Moses and obedience, I asked a few people on Facebook why they choose to be disobedient in any given situation. And one of those people is here tonight, but I won't reveal who they are or which their answer is. So here's what some of these people said. Being told not to do something if it's the right thing to do. I just go ahead and do it anyway. I didn't agree with what was being asked. I didn't think it was a wise choice. They're all very honest answers. When it wouldn't feel right to be obedient. Pride, self-sufficiency, stubbornness, a primal need to do it my way, a lack of belief and trust. Here's a very honest one. Speaking from experience, I can be quite bullheaded. Thank goodness for a relentless, loving and forgiving God. I'm disobedient because it's fun and I like to be naughty. Yeah, I bet there's someone there like that. Or how about this one? Because I'm mischievous and I can't help it. I bet we've all used that one, haven't we? I bet Adam has. I'll ask his mum later. I'm disobedient because I was afraid. Or I'm disobedient because I can be. Or, because I've been told to do or not do something, and no one has any right to tell me what to do. And if they do, I shall do the opposite, 
because I'm my own person and a rebel. Or how about this one? I'm a free spirit. Thank you, Jesus. None of us like doing what we are told if we don't agree with it, and I often don't. And we've seen tonight in this passage very clear that Moses was obedient to what God had told him to do. And obedience is key in discipleship, isn't it? Obedience to God. It's self-evident in the text. He wasn't perfect. He knew he wasn't perfect and that he couldn't speak well or clearly. Yet Moses went ahead obediently to do what God had told him to do. Despite his flaws, Moses obeyed God. God told Moses what to do and Moses went ahead and did it. So what lessons regarding obedience can we learn from the life of Moses in our passage tonight for our life of discipleship of God in the 21st century? Just as Moses was obedient to God, though at times falteringly, so are we to be, are we not? And one particular area is in the area of telling others about God. What does our text up there say? Jesus. Who do you say he is? And we're to be helping people as a church find and follow Jesus, aren't we? Are we doing that as individuals? As God's people, we are commanded to go and tell the world about God and the good news from God. That was Jesus' command to his disciple before he ascended to the right hand of the Father in Matthew 28. I know we do that as a church, but are we also doing it as individuals? This is a picture of Karen. We were at high school together in Australia. She is the one who first invited me to church where for the first time I heard that there is a God, that this God loved me, that this God had done all he could do to get me to be in an active and dynamic relationship with himself and I just needed to accept it and go running into his arms. And I did just about that about 36 years ago now. Praise God for Karen. But I have to ask the question, who are your pharaohs that God is wanting you to talk to about himself? Are we like Moses who in obedience to God went and talked with Pharaoh and told him what God had asked? Or are we like the people, the overseers who were obedient for a little while but gave up when it got tough? A growing number of people we try to talk to about God say pretty much the same as Pharaoh, don't they? Who is this Lord? I know no Lord. There is no God. What are you talking about, man? Wake up. And while they may not explicitly say that they are God, implicitly they are saying it because they've created themselves to be God. Their own God. Again, is it just me that encounters people like that? And when they say that, are we polite and go back to the Lord and talk to him about these people just as Moses did? And sometimes I have been known to say to people who are stunningly intransigent, something along these lines. Well, mate, if you're right that there is no God and I am wrong, then you'll be okay and I'll be okay because there'll be nothing after death. You'll have lived the life you wanted to live and you know what? So will I. But if you're wrong and I'm right that there is a loving God who created us, what then? That this God has done everything possible for you to be in an active, living, dynamic and intimate relationship with him, then after our inev inevitable death, you will have lost everything and I have gained everything. Do you now want to hear again about this God that loves you? Perhaps it's just me who gets away with saying things like that. Will there be one other person in heaven because of what you said to them about God? We're not all called to be like Billy Graham and to be evangelists, but we are called to do the work of an evangelist, aren't we, at least? Will there be one other person in heaven because of, what you're, because of you and what you've said to them? Heaven is a great big place. There'll be plenty of room. God has prepared a place for all of those who love him, trust him and obey him. God is expecting us and wanting us, wanting to lavish his love upon us. We know he loves us now, but that love is now only in part, isn't it? 
when we're with him in eternity, we shall continue to explore that love forever, to explore that intimacy. God is with us now in spirit, but then we shall be with him physically, face to face. Heaven is a prepared place of extraordinary beauty. When was the last time that you or I told somebody about heaven and how to get there? About this loving God. As for today, there is plenty of space in our church building here during both the morning and the evening services for people outside of here to come and hear the good news about God. Thank God for this church and for the works doing for its glory, for God's glory alone. In the bulletin this week, None of this has been set up, by the way. This has all come through. As for today, in the bulletin this week, David Combs wrote this. I promise you this is not set up. Witnessing is sharing. It is communicating our experience of God and the truth in the Bible. To do so effectively, we need to prepare. Reflect on your journey. Consider the twists and turns on your road back to the Great Shepherd. Secondly, continually familiarise yourself with the written word. The Holy Spirit is active in both. Our courage should come from this, being mindful in how God could use us. And now for a, a final area of obedience for tonight, before we go on briefly to our second word from the passage concerning the life of Moses. And that's in the area of being obedient to our church leaders. This is a toughie for those of us who are naturally recalcitrant against leadership. Sorry, Adam. And I know that this can be a difficult area, and I know that I've had to seek forgiveness and repent where I've sinned against them. I have had an occasion to go to our leaders and say, sorry, forgive me for sinning against you. And in their graciousness, they have forgiven me. And Moses in our story tonight was very gracious to those people from his own nation who were grumbling, being discourteous and fickle. Are we sometimes like those people of the nation of Israel? Or are we like Moses? At the moment, I'm sure you are well aware, there is a concerted effort from our leadership team in regard to our financial giving in this church. Understandably so. We're all being asked to reconsider the amount of our financial giving to the Lord's work in this, in and through this church, going out into our local community and into the wider world. The leadership didn't know I was going to say this, and I think most people here would know that they wouldn't come to me and ask me to say what I'm going to say, because I just tell them to get lost. But it's been put on my heart by God to say something about it. And I must be obedient to Him, mustn't I? particularly as we're talking about being obedient. And we're to be obedient to our leaders as they are obedient to God. Just as the people of Israel were to be obedient to Moses as Moses was to God. And if we have grumbles and complaints, then we're to go to our leaders in private and have a quiet word, perhaps. No bitterness or grumbling disconcertingly amongst ourselves or with those outside the church. Of course, I'm speaking as much to myself as I am to you. Also, it's not a blind obedience born of slavery or brainwashing, but an obedience born from knowing that God is in charge and that he is leading our leaders, just as they are leading us. And we're free to refuse to obey, because we're not a cult where the words of our leaders are to be taken unquestioningly. We've been asked this year to think about our individual giving. Have we done that yet? As Christians, we all desire to mature spiritually and obedience plays a big part in that. And perhaps one of the greatest indicators of this in 21st century discipleship concerns our financial giving. I'm sure most of us know that giving financially is to be done wholeheartedly and cheerfully. And God also looks beyond the amount that is given to the motive behind it. All our money and possessions belong to God anyway, so giving is to be in response to this. Failure to give back for God's work what he has given in the first place, who does that rob? God. 
And the reason it's robbery is because the giving cannot be used to support those who are working for God. Sorry, Adam, you can't have a second Porsche, all right? (laughs) And giving financially to God's work in and through this place is obedience to God, is it not? So are we being obedient? And from this passage, the first word I received about the life of Moses was obedience. And now for our second letter, second word which Adam mentioned earlier, and he didn't, I didn't tell him about this yesterday when we had a conversation. Our second word is intimacy, because intimacy is born from obedience, isn't it? It's a word that I know scares most men. And Moses knew God intimately. Do you get that picture? We get that portrait through the text tonight and we will continue to do so in this series. A further question for you. How is your own intimacy with God? And to be in a a Christian is to be in a, a dynamic and intimate relationship with God. He is our Father and we are His children, are we not? It's a development of intimacy between Almighty God and our individual selves. It's going on with life, developing that relationship and refining that unique bond between God and the individual. Personally, to know that God desires for me to know him more and more is of great encouragement to me. How easy it is to forget that. I mean, I know I've got memory problems, but can I forget that truly? Sometimes I do. And it's a developing and maturing intimacy between God and myself. Could the same be said of you? We develop our intimacy with God through prayer, both in speaking and in listening. And the major way we can hear God speak is through the Bible, is it not? It's his written word. Yet how often do we just leave it lying on the shelf? That's why prayer and reading the Bible go hand in hand. How's your prayer life and your reading of the Bible? It's my desire that I will continue going on in life, developing my intimacy with God. Talking to him throughout the day, not just in the morning or the evening for a short time, when I remember. I also desire that each person I meet will either start that relationship with God or they will go on developing their relationship with God. Developing an intimacy with God. An intimacy born from obedience to God just as Moses did, as evidenced in our passage tonight. And as we go through this series, we will see this intimacy between God and Moses develop. An intimacy born from obedience and discipleship going hand in hand with each other. And as we close now, some questions for you to think about. How is your obedience to God developing for you? How is your intimacy with God developing? God desires to be intimate with you. Are you finding it hard going sometimes? Then we're to do as Moses did and go to God in prayer and be honest in our prayers. Moses was, wasn't he? Straight talking? Australian-like? I mean, I know you're English. God loves you. He cares for you. He craves for you. He yearns for you. He cares for you and he wants to help you. Will you ask him for help and then let him help you? There are people here in this church who will help you if you let them. And if you need help, simply ask one of the team and they will sort it for you. I know they will. Let's go from here prepared to be obedient to God, prepared to tell at least one other person about him, and also to consider our giving financially to the work of God through this church in obedience to our leaders who are seeking to be obedient to God. Going from here to continue developing our intimate relationship with God. And we can do it in his strength and in his power. Let's close with prayer, shall we? Oh, Father, thank you again for your written word. And I pray that the words I've said tonight were, were faithful to, to, to what you wanted me to say. May we leave here uh, 
with more to do to extend your kingdom because we are your helpers. Help each one of us here to develop our intimacy with you, to develop our relationship with you. And may this week, may each of us encounter somebody who will ask us for the reason, for the hope that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray this, Father, through the name of your Son, Jesus, our Saviour, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who lives within each of us who are your children, who empowers us, strengthens us, encourages us, cares for us, comforts us, and above all, unites us as a family which loves you. Amen.